So one of the things that we've seen in education, in technology, in business is a huge growth in the affinity and usage of the word design. But very few people understand what that means. So what I like to do is talk about design through the lens of creativity. All of us are natural creators. All of us are creative at our core. The word design creates a bifurcation in the marketplace and allows some of us to feel creative and the rest of us to feel just technical, which I think is ridiculous. So this notion of us versus them. Us is typically design. It's the creative group that sits in the back of the room that makes weird noises and you know, weird smells and loud music and just all these different things that people don't think are mar is margin accretive. And then there's them, the managers, the operators, the people that control the budget, that make people like me feel valued or not valued on any, any given day. Because if you have the budget, you have the love. But in the new economy, it's us plus them. The, the, the merger of design and business is critical because it's a differentiator. It allows you to show up in the marketplace and be distinct. Brands of distinction are the, are distinction are the ones that will lead the marketplace. It's not enough to just innovate because technology is no longer fascinating to the consumers that we design for. They expect it to work. They expect it to be magical. They expect it to be something they can interact with and engage with. So when you design something, you're really creating an experience that transcends beyond the screen. It's going from pixels to possibilities. The piece that I want to leave you with, though, is that all this work that I talked about, it starts with reimagining how your teams compete together. There is no longer this vertical of design over here, technology over here, business over here. It's a collaboration. It's an asterisk organization, not a T-type organization. There's no such thing as a singular discipline. You have to know what I do just as much as I have to know what you do. That's how you're going to compete in the new economy. The businesses that you all represent are businesses that I love and adore and that I grew up with. Some of you, I mean, looking at Gap right here, this is a brand that I've admired for years. This, you know, I see Pepsi, Cohen, Verizon. I actually have Verizon as a carrier, so thank you. Good service. And what's been interesting is that it's a part of someone's life. We don't get to see how it works, but we know how it makes us feel. And that's the power of technology. You can understand how people feel and keep giving that value to them consistently, you know, consistently in a way that they never imagined. So as you go back to your jobs and you think about what it is you're doing, you're not creating technology. You're not enabling teams. What you're doing is you're providing wonderment and joy to people that you'll never meet. You're creating ways for people to dream and create their own opportunities. You're not just stuck to this vertical of being a CTO or a CEO or a CMO or a CRO and all the C-suite executives. No, you're actually the person on the front line delivering value to people like myself who grew up to dream of becoming you one day. So each and every one of you can live in your Michael Jordan moment if you leverage the power of what's in front of you, which is the data that we all create and generate these days. This is about how you build it. So as we go through that, a lot of how we build it gets shaped by kind of the characteristics of this. So if you look at a headset, headset is the classical example of trade-offs. Now, all product development is about trade-offs. Right? You do this, that goes out of whack. Let's look at this one. So you look at the use cases. So Bo says, well, it's somebody half the time in the office got to solve the ambient noise problem. Right? You're going to solve all the ambient noise problems. Tells you the size. Well, it's got to cover the ear. How do we know the ear? Because Darren's folks have done a bunch of research on, you know, here's the median size, here's one standard deviation, do you want to cover 95% of the audience, and this is what you want to do, tells us the size. But they don't tell us it's 43 millimeters or so on. They tell us here are the problems to solve. And I think there's a question earlier about product management has a continuously evolving view of the world. Absolutely. So what they have is an evolving view of the world. What we do is take a snapshot. At this point in time, I'm going to have this size, battery life. Everybody always wants infinite battery life, right? Nobody likes charging their devices. How long is acceptable? Because when you start, based on technology today, based on what we understand of the needs, based on the technology today, here's the battery we can use. Because the other part that we have under this, there's a cost target to it as well. So I can always put a more expensive battery in, which will be smaller, have higher energy density, that's going to raise the cost up. So within the technology available today, within the components available today, taking a snapshot of it, we write the specifications. And, and of course, if you make your bat, given the size of this, I know I can fit a certain size of battery in, so there's a constraint. I can make the battery size, battery life twice as long by putting a bigger battery. What does that do? Make the size big. Uh, that changes the weight. And the last part of it is the fashion part. Because unlike most products, and I came out of the networking industry, I used to work at Cisco and so on, 
thing about a router or a switch, nobody ever saw it. You stick it in the wiring closet and it stays there forever. So if it's bigger, who cares? This one, you put it on your face. People are kind of sensitive to stuff they put on their face. Uh, so we, so anything you do, if it looks big, guess what? Could be an amazing product. It's too big. People won't buy it just because, well, it looks too big. Makes me look terrible. It's a great product. Don't care. Makes me look bad. So what are the objectives and goals for a platform product? And what, what is a platform? So if you actually look at the, the picture on the, on the right here, this is a printed circuit board with a, a CSR or Qualcomm chip on it. And as you can see, the, the design is actually dominated by the chip. The chip is the main component on the board. We have a few passives, there's some resistors and capacitors, there's maybe a crystal, a little bit of memory. But actually, the heart of this PCB is the, the chip. And we, what we can take is, you know, add a battery, add an antenna, maybe add microphones and, and a speaker. And we've created the basics of a headset product or a sound bar. So, it, this is really what we call a platform on a chip. We're solving a significantly complex problem for the customer, both hardware and software. So it's a hardware chip, but we're running a full uh, firmware and application software. So in terms of the design priorities for, for the team, well, clearly, there's a lot of integration going on here. We've hoovered up all these external components. So this is analog and digital. So you have to integrate the radio, the power management, battery charges, and that requires high voltage devices. So you have to look at the process node for that. Long battery life. Shantanu talked about the, the battery life or the size of the battery being very important. So we have to optimize for battery life and that's both active power and also standby. If you put it in the drawer for, for a couple of months and get the product out, you want it to still be alive and working. So you know, ac active and passive. And then obviously die area. We need to create a, a competitive uh, product and that means getting it as small as we possibly can. We did make a lot of changes to the engine, but we also did this um, the, the, the last two to three years were very important for us in terms of actually launching the product. Now we did start somewhere in the 2000, between 2008 and 2013 we already started collecting voice of the customer in terms of what is it that you would like to have and I think Dan alluded to this, the customer is very, very averse to adding what I would call as after treatment which is trying to clean up the pollutants outside of the engine, right? Clap trap, I think, is what Dan called it. So they were very averse to clap trap. So obviously then that means you collect all these voice of customers from, from, from different customers that we have, four or five main railroad customers, and then you say, well, every time they give you a new input, that can lead to some cost overruns, right? We had a cost target that we had to meet that the customers can digest and we can still make some money out of this product. So then we looked at, okay, um, where are all these cost overruns? So it's engineering leakage. Every time the customer tells you I need something more, we engineers get very excited. We go do something more and that's adding cost. And Dan calls me up and says, Ram, you know, you add another 3% to this. Okay, the other thing was also some of the pipeline gaps. What I call as pipeline gaps is every time you use and you try to use a new technology, for example, that's going to be to solve a particular voice of the customer uh, requirement. That's also going to cost you some sort of um, a new um, innovation, maybe some new tweak, and that's going to cost some money. So that's the engineering pipeline gap because I didn't have all the technologies in, say, 2008 or 2010 even for a product that's going to be launching in 2015. Right? So that's some new learning, some new costs. And obviously, right, Dan never counts on inflation. I think uh, uh, our commercial folks look mostly at deflation. They never think of inflation. So, so there was some inflation along the way. Um, and then there's also some pipeline gaps from sourcing. Because remember, as engineers, we like to invent. We like to add more features. And obviously, that means the sourcing folks are now telling me, Ram, I can't use the same thing I used on tier three. I'm going to go to my supplier. It's a new casting. It's a new forging. He's going to charge me an arm and a leg. Uh, can I have your arms and your legs? So that's kind of, the, that's kind of how the discussion goes, right? Mm -hmm.